The Celestial Railroad, Part 3 Sir, inquired he with a sad yet mild and kindly voice, do you call yourself a pilgrim? Yes, I replied. My right to that appellation is indubitable. I'm merely a sojourner here in Vanity Fair, being bound to the celestial city by the new railroad. Alas, friend, rejoined Mr. Stick to the right, I do assure you and beseech you to receive the truth of my words, that that whole concern is a bubble. You may travel on it all your lifetime, where you live a thousands of years, and yet never get beyond the limits of Vanity Fair. Yea, though you should deem yourself entering the gates of the blessed city, it will be nothing but a miserable delusion. The Lord of the Celestial City, began the other pilgrim, whose name was Mr. Foot to Heaven, has refused and will ever refuse to grant an act of incorporation for this railroad, and unless that be obtained, no passenger can ever hope to enter his dominions. Wherefore, every man who buys a ticket must lay his account with losing the purchase money, which is the value of his own soul. Pa! Nonsense, said Mr. Smoothed Way, taking my arm and leading me off. These fellows ought to be indicted for liable. If the law stood as it once did in Vanity Fair, we should see them grinning through the iron bars of the prison window. This incident made a considerable impression on my mind and contributed with other circumstances to indispose me to permanent residence in the city of Vanity. Although, of course, I was not simple enough to give up my original plan of gliding along easily and commodiously by railroad. Still, I grew anxious to be gone. There was one strange thing that troubled me. Amid the occupations or amusements of the fair, nothing was more common than for a person, whether at feast, theater, or church, or trafficking for wealth and honors, or whatever he might be doing, and however unseasonable the interruption, suddenly to vanish like a soap bubble and be never more seen of his fellows. And so accustomed were the latter to such little accidents that they went on with their business as quietly as if nothing had happened. But it was otherwise with me. Finally, after a pretty long residence at the fair, I resumed my journey toward the celestial city, still with Mr. Smoothed away at my side. At a short distance beyond the suburbs of Vanity, we passed the ancient silver mine, of which the Demis was the first discoverer, and which is now wrought with great advantage, supplying nearly all the coin currency of the world. A little further onward was the spot where Lot's wife had stood forever under the semblance of a pillar of salt. Curious travelers have long since carried it away piecemeal. Had all regrets been punished as rigorously as this poor dam's were, my yearning for the relinquished delights of Vanity Fair might have produced a similar change in my own corporeal substance and left me a warning to future pilgrims. The next remarkable object was a large edifice constructed of moss-grown stone, but in a modern and airy style of architecture. The engine came to a pause in its vicinity and with the usual tremendous shriek. This was formerly the castle of the redoubted giant Despair, observed Mr. Smoothed Away. But since his death, Mr. Flimsy Faith has repaired it and keeps an excellent house of entertainment here. It is one of our stopping places. It seems but slightly put together, remarked I, looking at the frail yet ponderous walls. I do not envy Mr. Flimsy Faith his habitation. Some day it will thunder down upon the heads of the occupants. We shall escape at all events, said Mr. Smoothed Away, for Apollyon is putting on the steam again. The road now plunged into the gorge of the delectable mountains and traversed the field where, in former ages, the blind men wandered and stumbled among the tombs. One of these ancient tombstones had been thrust across the track by some malicious person and gave the train of cars a terrible jolt. 
Far up the rugged side of a mountain, I perceived a rusty iron door, half overgrown with bushes and creeping plants, but with smoke issuing from its crevasses. Is that, inquired I, the very door in the hillside which the shepherd's assured Christian was a byway to hell? That was a joke on the part of the shepherds, said Mr. Smooth it away with a smile. It is neither more nor less than a door of a cavern which they use as a smokehouse for the preparation of mutton hams. My recollections of the journey are now for a little space dim and confused, inasmuch as a singular drowsiness here overcame me owing to the fact that we were passing over the enchanted ground, the air of which encouraged a disposition to sleep. I awoke, however, as soon as we crossed the borders of the pleasant land of Bella. All the passengers were rubbing their eyes, comparing watches, and congratulating one another on the prospect of arriving so seasonably at the journey's end. The sweet breezes of this happy climb came refreshingly to our nostrils. We beheld the glimmering gush of silver fountains, overhung by trees of beautiful foliage and delicious fruit, which were propagated by grass from the celestial garden. Once, as we dashed onward like a hurricane, there was a flutter of wings and the bright appearance of an angel in the air, speeding forth on some heavenly mission. The engine now announced the close vicinity of the final station house by one last and horrible scream, in which there seemed to be distinguishable every kind of wailing and woe, the bitter fierceness of wrath, all mixed up with the wild laughter of a devil or a madman. Throughout our journey, at every stopping place, Apollyon had exercised his ingenuity in screwing the most abominable sounds out of the whistle of the steam engine. But in this closing effort, he outdid himself and created an infernal uproar, which, besides disturbing the peaceful inhabitants of Bella, must have sent its discord even through the celestial gates. While the horrid clamor was still ringing in our ears, we heard an exulting strain, as if a thousand instruments of music, with height and depth and sweetness in their tones, at once tender and triumphant, were struck in unison to greet the approach of some illustrious hero who had fought the good fight and won a glorious victory, and was come to lay aside his battered arms forever. Looking to ascertain what might be the occasion of this glad harmony, I perceived on alighting from the cars that a multitude of shining ones had assembled on the other side of the river to welcome two poor pilgrims who were just emerging from its depths. They were the same whom Apollyon and ourselves had persecuted with taunts and jibes and scalding steam at the commencement of our journey, the same whose unworldly aspect and impressive words had stirred my conscience amid the wild revelers of Vanity Fair. How amazingly well those men have got on, cried I to Mr. Smooth it away. I wish we were secure of as good a reception. Never fear, never fear, answered my friend. Come, make haste. The ferry boat will be off directly, and in three minutes, you will be on the other side of the river. No doubt you will find coaches to carry you up to the city gates. A steam ferry boat, the last improvement on this important route, lay at the riverside, puffing and snorting and emitting all of those other disagreeable utterances which betokened the departure to be immediate. I hurried on board with the rest of the passengers, most of whom were in great perturbation, some bawling out for their baggage, some tearing their hair and exclaiming that the boat would explode or sink, some already pale with the heaving of the stream, some gazing affrighted at the ugly aspect of the steersman, and some still dizzy with the slumberous influences of the enchanted ground. Looking back to the shore, I was amazed to discern Mr. Smooth it away, waving his hand in token of farewell. Don't you go over to the celestial city, exclaimed I. Oh, no, answered he with a queer smile, and that same disagreeable contortion of visage which I had remarked in the inhabitants of the dark valley. Oh, no, I've come this far only for the sake of your pleasant company. Goodbye, we shall meet again. 
And then did my excellent friend, Mr. Smoothaway, laugh outright. Ha, ha, ha. In the midst of which cachination, a smoke wreath issued from his mouth and nostrils, while a twinkle of lurid flame darted out of either eye, proving indubitably that his heart was all of a red blaze. The impudent fiend! To deny the existence of Tophet when he felt its fiery tortures raging within his breast. I rushed to the side of the boat, intending to fling myself on shore, but the wheels, as they begin their revolution, threw a dash of spray over me so cold, so deadly cold, with the chill that will never leave those waters until death be drowned in its own river, that with a shiver and a heartquake, I awoke. Thank heaven, it was a dream. And thus ends our story, and I hope you liked it. Please reach down and click like and subscribe if you haven't, and leave a comment. Love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.